So this paper might look a little bit familiar. This is the 2020 biology, uh, GCE biology paper for paper two. So today I actually wanted us to go through the first three questions. So you want us to go through this question here on the kidney glomerulus. This is a cross section or section. By the way, there's a difference between the structure of the kidney and then the detailed structure of the kidney. So this kidney glomerulus are the small repeating units that, are, that actually make up the kidney tissue. So you remember um, a tissue, uh, tissue, various tissues come together to make an organ, that cell organization. So a lot of nephrons clumped together will make a complete structure of the kidney. So this is just like a, one small functional unit uh, of the kidney. You actually have billions and billions of nephrons uh, that make up your kidney. Then we have to look at this question, uh, which talks about the eye. I don't know, this paper was a little bit cut. I haven't found question one and two, but I'll try looking for what came in terms of question one and two so that we go through that as well. Then uh, this is actually the external structure of the human eye. There's also the internal structure which shows um, things like the suspensory ligaments and the upper humor actually found within the eye. So the good part is that this question was actually just the external structure of the eye. You have to label a few parts and talk about the function of each individual uh, component and also talk a little bit about something known as accommodation. Uh, what happens when the eye contracts or relaxes in response to dim light and also the uh, causes of short-sightedness, also known as myopia, and also how you can fix uh, short-sightedness. So are you adding a diverging lens? Are you adding a converging lens? What is the science behind short-sightedness? And then uh, question five, then this is section D. So question five is just a little bit about genetics. So we have to be able to construct um, uh, a, a family linked uh, mode of inheritance. You know, how uh, do alleles segregate to cause someone to inherit a, a, a particular trait? And the good part about these diagrams, these pair, these uh, inheritance diagrams, they actually carry a lot of marks. Like this one carried four marks just to draw a very simple diagram and explaining something known as a, a sex-linked uh, characteristic. So let's uh, uh, begin. Are you ready for us to begin? Yes. All right. So uh, question one, if I can just. So below shows uh, a section through a nephron. So remember a lot of these nephrons come together to make a complete kidney. So here we have to be able to label this uh, diagram. And you know, the nephron is like a collection of capillaries. If you remember when we were doing the process of filtration, we said the nephron is like um, a, a a filter paper like a tea strainer. So it serves to filter out because you know, actually other than the heart and brain, the kidney is one of the major organs that receives a lot of blood from the rest of the body because you want to filter out all those wastes, especially urea that, you know, we, uh, that's very toxic. You know, there's a lot of catabolic and anabolic processes that happen within the body, especially during the process of digestion that release very toxic substances. Um, so those toxic substances are conjugated by the, by the kidney. For example, uh, ammonia, very um, ammonia. There's a process known as deamination where very uh, toxic ammonia is converted into urea and it's excreted through the kidneys. So those very toxic substances are actually filtered uh, in the kidney glomerulus. But the 
things that are very important, things that you need, like a glucose, um, your so some amino acids and certain fatty acids, because they are too big, they won't be able to pass through uh, the T strain, known as the glomerulus. So it's something like this. So this is the, the T strainer over the human body. And uh, what makes the pores are these blood capillaries. So these blood capillaries sort of make like the pores. They are in all two of them clumped together. No wonder they are called a tuft of capillaries, a tuft of capillaries. So there's an, egg, uh, an entrance point and there's an exit point. So here there's a blood vessel where blood comes from the rest of the body. So from body, from body into uh, the glomerulus. And this part is where now after blood has been filtered, it exits. Sir. Yes. Someone is boring me outside to open the gate. Oh, uh, let me just, uh, I can, let me pause the recording. Then you can uh, go open the gate. Sorry, we're having the lecture this time. It's my fault because of this. Right, so I was telling you that, you know, the kidney is like um, the tea strainer of the body. So as blood is passing, as blood enters the kidneys, it gets filtered. And then all these waste products, you know, like uh, urea, uh, water, uh, salt, you know, uh, salt, which is sodium, potassium, ETC, they start passing through uh, the descending loop and then the ascending loop. And then eventually they collect in duct. But you know, the body still needs water, the body still needs sodium, because you know, these electrolytes are very uh, small. So they will definitely be able to pass through these pores of uh, the glomerulus. So here on this part here, there's something known as uh, selective reabsorption that occurs. Selective uh, reabsorption. So here, the T strainer part, it's called uh, ultrafiltration. And then here, the descending loop, uh, uh, ascending loop and transverse loop, and uh, the collecting duct, there's something known as selective reabsorption that takes place, meaning all these electrolytes that you need, like uh, sodium and uh, water, uh, potassium, they get reabsorbed back into the body because they are still needed. So the only thing that remains here is a water, a urea and a little bit of water, urea, water, and uh, just a little bit of electrolytes, a bit of potassium, uh, a little bit of sodium. But most of the essential uh, uh, minerals are filtered. But because things, certain things are big, things like um, uh, glucose, things like certain uh, proteins and some fatty acids, these are big and they are still needed by the body. They won't be filtered back. But if someone has diabetes, someone who produces so much sugar in their system, there'll be so much sugar concentrated in their blood that it will filter through because of its high concentration. And you are going to find glucose in urine. In a normal state, you are not supposed to have glucose uh, in the urine because it's too big, it's filtered. But because in a diabetic patient, this glucose is in so much concentration, it will pass through this filter because it's just a lot. So we need to name this part here the, the blood vessel where blood enters the kidney and the other blood vessel where blood exits the kidney. So because blood here is exiting the kidney, this blood vessel here, we call it the efferent, the efferent um, 
the efferent uh, atom, the efferent atom. And because here blood is entering the kidney, we are calling this the afferent, the afferent uh, atom. So here I like to use this efferent one here because it's synonymous with eggs. So if you see an arrow that's pointing away from the glomerulus, it means blood is exiting the glomerulus. So that exit efferent. Then I'll just remember, oh, afferent means blood coming in. So here, this arrow here is pointing towards uh, the kidney. So this is the afferent, afferent uh, artery or arterial, if you want to call it, uh, it that way. So this one that's it's labeled as J. So this is the apparent apparent artery, blood going into the kidney. Then this thing here, the filter, the Chiho filter is known as the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule. Hmm. A lot of biology students in high school. The only thing they, they don't understand the urinary system such that the only thing that they end up knowing is the Bowman's capsule. They'll be like, oh, that cup looking diagram is the, the Bowman's capsule. You have to go beyond just knowing what this Bowman's capsule is. You also have to know its function. So remember in biology, like I told you, you have to know the structure and what the structure actually does. And then this looks like the ending of uh, the journey of the urine. So this is the collecting duct. The collecting duct. So because I've explained all these things, it's very easier now to talk about uh, this question here. So this question, the next question says, um, suggest three substances that are not filtered by J. So remember, it's a T-strainer. So what things are big that can filter here? These things here. Glucose, uh, proteins, and some fatty acids. They should never be filtered because they are very much needed in the body. So you can say glucose or your carbohydrates, your proteins, as well as uh, fatty acids. Then we move on to this question, which says, uh, explain what would happen if J, uh, the, uh, the coiling of blood capillary was increased. So if J, so if you added, you have a T strainer and you add another T strainer on top, do you think things are going to filter uh, more easily or it would be very hard for things to filter? It would be hard for things to filter, right? Because you've added more, you've added like another T strainer. So here, we're going to say filtration is going to reduce. So ultra filtration. Ultra filtration will Reduce it means the kidney won't filter uh, a lot of those substances, you know, which is bad because, like I said, urea has to be able to filter out because it's very toxic, and you actually want to filter out this urea, and then you just add another uh, another T strainer. It means most of that urea is going to be retained, so uh, filtration is going to reduce, which uh, is a bad thing. So let's move on to the final question, which says, uh, name the hormone that causes reabsorption of water in the kidney and the organ where it's produced. So reabsorption of water takes place here in, the, in these loops, the descending loop, the um, transverse loop, and the descending loop uh, of Henry. So this is called the loop of Henry there. This whole structure here is known as the loop of Henry. And there's a hormone known as uh, ADH, meaning anti-diuretic hormone. So this is actually a very interesting hormone because it acts on these cells. There are actually cells here in the loop of Henry. So in the influence of ADH, it's actually going to cause you to retain water. So 
So it's going to actively reabsorb water back into the body. So it helps you when they say actively reabsorb water, it's helping you retain water. Because it's helping you retain water, it's also helping you retain your mineral salts. Your mineral salts like you know potassium, sodium, etc., that are very much needed to maintain proper electrolyte balance within the body. So you've noticed that when people are for alcoholics, a lot of alcoholics, they tend to go to the bathroom a lot. If you drink alcohol, you, you see that, okay, these people are actually going to the bathroom a lot. It's because alcohol actually affects this hormone, antidiuretic hormone. It's also called vasopressin. So a lot of uh, alcohol affects this hormone, the ADH hormone, meaning you are not going to be able to retain water and mineral salts. So water won't be actively reabsorbed back into your body, but it's going to uh, be uh, uh, eliminated in the urinary system. So this hormone is actually inhibited when you drink alcohol. So you won't retain water, so you are going to pee a lot. And what are you peeing? You are peeing water and mineral salts. No wonder when you drink too much alcohol, you end up with a hangover. You are going to feel very dehydrated because this ADH here has been inhibited. So you are losing a lot of water and you are losing a lot of electrolytes. So if someone has a hangover, they should, you know, uh, drink a little bit of water which has some electrolytes, like, you know, some lemon tea or something like that to just replace uh, the loss of these electrolytes to just rehydrate the body. So that's the function of ADH. It actually helps you retain water. It helps you absorb water back into your body, water and mineral salts. And uh, this hormone is produced by the hypothalamus. So say uh, anti-diuretic hormone, you know the spelling in brackets, ADH produced by the hypothalamus. Has this question made sense? Yes. All right. So let's move on to this question of the eye. So here, this is actually an easy diagram to, to label. So this part M here is the pupil. This part here is the whitish thing that you see, known as the sclera. In actually, some people, if, if there are some people who, when they are very sick, their eyes actually turn this uh, yellow color. This yellow color, especially in uh, liver cirrhosis, like liver damage or kidney damage, you find that people's eyes are going to, uh, the, the color of the eye is going to turn like very yellow. It's known as jaundice. It actually shows that, okay, this patient is actually starting to undergo uh, organ failure. So it's, you know, it's also a sign of disease. So usually your sclera is that white thing that you see. Very, very important. It actually protects um, your eyes. Um, uh, there's a fluid found within the eye known as aphas humor. So it actually helps protect that. And then here is, uh, this is your iris. The good part about the iris is that it contains uh, different shades of color. It has different shades of color. You know, some people have brown eyes, some people have green eyes, some people have blue eyes. So that's the colored part. But it's also uh, functions in accommodation. Accommodation, it uh, has these uh, suspensory ligaments and muscles that can actually contract and relax when someone is in a bright room or someone enters a dim room, which we're going to explain. So name the parts labeled uh, M and M. So M, this is your pupil, we labeled that. And then N is your sclera. Then here we're saying, uh, explain how N is adapted to 
expansion. So like I said, the sclera is this whitish stuff region uh, that protects uh, the, the, the eye's fluid. So here we can actually say it's a, it's a white, tough outer layer of connective tissue. I want you to use this term. It's actually what makes it, it tough is that it actually has a lot of connective tissue, of connective tissue. So this is uh, uh, the adaptation. It's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough outer layer. What makes it tough? This way it's connective tissue. So the key word here is this one, connective tissue and tough outer layer. So you can get uh, your two marks from that. Then the question goes on saying, uh, describe the role played by the pew pew and O, which is uh, the pew pew and the iris when the eye moves from, uh, when the eye moves to a, to a room with dim light. So yeah, you're moving to a room with uh, dim light. Meaning dim light, there, is, there isn't so much electricity or there isn't so much eye entering the, um, the eye. There isn't so much light entering the eye. <laughs> So the first thing that has to happen is the size of the pupil. So let me draw a cross section or a diagram so that you see properly. So you're in bright light. This is your size of your pupil and these are the muscles of your iris. So what's going to happen here when you are in bright light, the pupil, the size of the pupil here is small. But when you enter this dim light phase, these muscles, your suspensory ligaments in your iris are going to relax. So because they are going to relax, the size of the pupil is going to uh, become bigger. So the muscles of the iris have relaxed, causing the pupil to actually dilate so that you can accommodate more light so that you see properly. So what's happening to the pupil? So you say the pupil, dilates and then the, the iris, the iris muscles relax. If you go into bright light, the pupil uh, is going to constrict, it's going to reduce in size because these iris muscles will actually uh, constrict also. Uh, they'll, they'll constrict also. So the size of the pupil is going to uh, reduce. So pupil dilates because you are entering a place with, with dim light. You have to see properly because these muscles here surrounding the, the pupil have relaxed. So it's easier for the pupil for, for the pupil to dilate because these iris muscles have relaxed. They are losing so much tension uh, holding the lens. So it, the, the pupil is going to dilate. Are you getting me clearly? Yes. All right. So explain what causes a short-sightedness and how it can be corrected. So I just want you to memorize this because um, short-sightedness, this is your lens and uh, images are formed on the retina. So the back of your eye here, contains a lot of photoreceptive cells. Photoreceptive meaning they are sensitive to light. So this is your retina. So what happens when light enters someone's eye? In someone with short-sightedness, the image is going to be formed here. The image is going to be formed before the retina instead of being formed here. So the person is going to actually have short-sightedness. So the cause of short-sightedness is that um, Light, light focuses before the retina. So that's the cause. So what do you do with the uh, to fix this? You put a diverging lens here so that you give the light a head start. So it the light will actually go like that. 
and it's going to diverge there. The light will diverge a little bit so that it can focus properly on the retina. So you correct this short-sightedness uh, short by use, use a diverging, a diverging lens. So because you've memorized this, you can actually just use the opposite. So if they remove this and say uh, far-sightedness, you can actually say light focuses beyond the retina, then the opposite of a diverging lens is a converging lens. So you use a converging lens. So this is the question on um, the eye. So just read more. You know, there are a lot of YouTube videos that actually explain the eye. Just watch a little bit of some YouTube videos. To just understand uh, these principles in, in depth. You need to pass biology. If there are subjects that I actually want you to pass properly, it's math, English, biology, and civic education. If you pass these four subjects, I'll be extremely happy. Even science will push through, even science will pass. But just make sure these, these four subjects I've mentioned, math, English, biology, and civic education, you already have a food and nutrition. So if you add that one, one course, you, you actually need uh, make a full certificate, but even science. Uh, when is the math paper? Twenty one, twenty one, twenty first. Uh, this month or July? July. July. Oh, all right. Okay. We have just a bit, just a bit of time. So let's talk about uh, genetics. So there is something known as this is actually a very common color blindness disorder. It's called red green color blindness. So let me actually explain the, the genetics behind this. So we do know that um, a, a female, there are things known as sex chromosomes. So if a baby inherits, you know, a male and a female. So this is female and this is male. There are things known as gametes. Gametes are your sex cells. Gametes are your sex cells. So the female egg, the female egg contains an X chromosome and the, the male sperm, there are two types of sperms that are produced by the male body. There is a sperm that carries an X chromosome and there's a sperm that carries a Y chromosome. So during fertilization, there are two scenarios here that form a zygote. So this is a female egg which only has one X chromosome, just one X chromosome. So if um, this ovum here fuses, or if this uh, or, uh, female sex uh, cell, this gametocyte, fuses with a sperm cell that carries an X chromosome, these, these things actually fuse. So this X chromosome is going to enter this, this egg. The baby will be XX. So this will become a female child. If a Y carrying sperm, remember this is X for the, the female, female only carries X chromosome. If a Y carrying sperm actually fuses with the egg, the child will be XY. So it will be a male, a, a male child. So who determines the sex of the baby? It's the father. So there are some fathers out there who say, no, sani pasa, uh, vamuna, etc. And then they start blaming the woman. It's not the woman's fault. The woman only provides one type of sex chromosome, which is an X chromosome. But the father carries two types of sperm cells. Some sperm cells carry an X chromosome, other sperm cells carry a Y chromosome. If that uh, egg 
which carries an X is penetrated by a sperm that carries an X chromosome, that would be XX. So the baby will be female. If that egg that carries an X chromosome is penetrated by a Y carrying sperm, that uh, fetus will be XY, which is male. But you know, nature, uh, sometimes nature is very unfair. Some of these chromosomes, you know, genes, uh, certain genes carry things known as mutations. All genes have mutations. Mutations can be good because, you know, some mutations occur and other people have uh, green eyes, blue eyes, uh, different colored skin. So mutations are good because some of them help us adapt to the environment. But at times, mutations are bad because if something happens to these genes that have been carried on these uh, X and Y chromosomes, you have things like... Uh, hemophilia, uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, albinism, color blindness, uh, a lot of uh, hereditary disorders are caused by these uh, bad types of mutations, including other less serious things like uh, red, green color blindness. So here, when they say an X-linked characteristic, is a characteristic that is transmitted through these uh, sex uh, chromosomes or gametocytes. So sex-linked characteristic uh, is a trait because you don't want to repeat characteristics. So you say it's a trait. A trait means characteristic. So it's a trait that is passed on a sex uh, chromosomes. So that's what sex linked means. So what can cause sex linked genetic disorders like the red green color? So actually this red green color is actually carried by the, the X chromosome. So it's on the X chromosome here. So let's say this is the gene for uh, this X chromosome is carrying one small gene that causes someone to have a color blindness. So look at this female here. The female has got two X chromosomes. So if the, the mother is carrying, if the mother has this uh, red, green color blindness disorder, she's going to pass it to a male child and a female child. But look at the interesting thing here. Females have got two X chromosomes. So there will be one properly normal functioning chromosome. So the female won't be affected by this uh, red green color blindness. No wonder they actually say uh, females are actually, they actually see uh, no colors better than males because this uh, disorder is carried on the X chromosome and females have got two extra chromosomes. But look at here, if, uh, so these children have inherited this X chromosome from their mother. But look at the girls, they have got an extra X chromosome, so they'll be fine. But look at the males, uh, they do not have an extra X chromosome, they have XY. So they'll definitely get it if the mother has uh, this particular trait, this uh, uh, color blindness. So this is what happens. So what can cause sex-linked genetic disorders uh, like the red, uh, like the red green chromosome? So what can cause these, these disorders um, if they are passed on the sex chromosomes? So what can cause sex-linked genetic disorders? So I can say uh, genes uh, causing genes causing the disorder being present on uh, sex chromosomes. So either the X chromosome or the Y chromosome. So let's look at this scenario here. So a normal couple had 
a color blind sun using the gene R for normal for normal color. So capital letter R is normal and uh, a vision and small letter R for color blindness. Write down the genotypes of uh, the father and the mother. So here they are normal, but they have a child who is um, who has color blindness. It actually means both the mother and the father are carriers. So you remember we inherit two types of genes, one from the father and one from the mother. So these people are carriers. So because they are normal, the mother, the father will be capital letter R, small letter R, this is very normal. The mother will also be capital letter R, small letter R, very normal. So when we're constructing our genetic tree, we have something like that, capital letter R, small letter R, capital letter R, small letter R. During the process of cell division uh, and fertilization, these gametocytes actually split like that. So the splitting stage here is known as segregation. Segregation, it's known as segregation. So you are going to have capital letter R, small letter R, capital letter R, small letter R. And then you have done mathematics. So here, the only thing that we are doing is is like we're expanding. So this capital letter R is going to multiply by this capital letter R to make R R. Then this same one here is going to multiply with this one here to make capital letter R, small letter R. Then you go to this one. This one is going to multiply with this one to make capital letter R, uh, small letter R, then this small letter R is going to multiply with this one to make small letter R, small letter R. So all these, uh, you've seen how we've cross multiplied. This one here that we split will multiply, it, it will like expand this one and this one. So you multiply this, then you also multiply that. Then this small letter R will expand this uh, R and uh, capital letter R and small letter R. So R times R, then capital letter R times small letter R, uh, small letter R times capital letter R, it's this one here, small letter R times small letter R, it's this one here. So the person, the child here, the son, who has this defective gene here, you can see all these kids are normal. This one is normal, this one is a carrier, this one is a carrier, and this one, the son is actually the one who has gotten this small letter R, small letter R. So this is the genetic diagram that actually shows that this child may, uh, could have been born with colored vision. So I'll, I will find more questions on genetics so that we can actually, you know, just know all these terms, segregation, ETC. All right, so let me end this meeting. Then I'll send you the video um, very shortly. I hope you enjoyed this class and understood uh, a few things. Have you? Yes. All right, I'll send you the video today. Let me just uh, log out and end the class. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay.